Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you, as well as our good friends uh, from C-SPAN who are joining us today, to the McGowan Theater, located in the National Archives Building in Washington, D.C. I'm Doug Swanson, Visitor Services Manager for the National Archives Museum and producer for the Noontime Lecture Series. Before we begin today's program, I'd like to remind you of some other programs that are coming your way in the near future. Tomorrow evening, October 8th at 7 p.m., the musical trio Cocktails for Three will be here to perform a number of obscure 1920s era prohibition songs as we continue to promote our current exhibit, Spirited Republic, Alcohol and American History, which you can view in the O'Brien Gallery until January 10th of 2016. On Wednesday, October 14th at 7 p.m., we'll present a film screening of Movies in Wartime, Projections of America. A discussion will follow the film. To find out more about these and our other programs and our exhibits, please take one of our monthly event calendars, which you'll find in the racks in the theater lobby, or you can visit our website at www.archives.gov calendar. Our topic for today is Henry Clay, America's Greatest Statesman by Harlow Giles Unger. Mr. Unger is a veteran journalist, broadcaster, educator, and historian. A former distinguished visiting fellow at George Washington's Mount Vernon, he is the author of 25 books, including three histories of early America and 10 biographies of America's founding fathers, among them George Washington, Lafayette, Patrick Henry, and James Monroe. Mr. Unger has appeared on History Channel and C-SPAN's Book TV and spoken many times at Mount Vernon, Yorktown, and many other historic sites. He is a graduate of, uh, graduate of Yale University with a Master of Arts from California State University. He spent many years as an American affairs analyst for the New York Herald Tribune Overseas News Service, the Times, and the Sunday Times of London, and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Two of his three most recent books, Mr. President and John Marshall, reveal how George Washington and John Marshall constructed the executive and judicial branches of the American government we know today. His latest book, Henry Clay, America's Greatest Statesman, tells how a fearless young Kentucky lawyer brought order to an unruly Congress, prevented the breakup of the nation, and created the Congress of the United States. Please join me in welcoming Harlow Giles Unger to the National Archives. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mr. Swanson. It's a, a privilege to be here at the National Archives today, uh, especially as the government seems to be in a kind of a state of flux right now. If I had uh, to choose one word that summarized the basis for our nation's survival over more than 200 years, it would not be patriotism, although that certainly contributed. And it wouldn't be natural resources, because that's two words. But they also contributed. Land, ingenuity, courage, brains, all contributed to the nation's growth and survival. But that's not the one single factor that has held us all together for all these years. This nation was founded and built on compromise. The Declaration of Independence was a compromise. Half the people who signed it wanted autonomy, not independence. They wanted to stay British. The Constitution was a compromise between slave states and free states, big states and little states, rural states and urban states. And once the national government assumed power, its survival over the next 60 years hinged on five five major compromises worked out by one man, the man I call America's greatest statesman, Henry Clay of Kentucky. Americans in his day called him the great compromiser because his compromises saved our nation from disintegration during the decades that led up to the Civil War. A little more than two centuries ago, Henry Clay, the young Henry Clay, walked into the House of Representatives and found bedlam. Almost every 
member carried a pistol in his pocket. Derringer had just invented this little one-shot pistol that everybody could carry in their pockets, and just about everybody in the House of Representatives did. Members fought on the floor, punching each other, wrestling like schoolboys. And then they'd step outside and fight a duel and shoot each other. One member bought a pe brought a pair of vicious hunting dogs to the floor each day to protect himself and to intimidate opponents. Although Clay was the youngest representative ever elected speaker and the only freshman ever elected to that post, Clay picked up his gavel and pounded that bunch of wild men into order and turned the House of Representatives into what the framers had intended when they wrote the Constitution. In doing so, he became the greatest speaker in American history. He laid down the rules of conduct for the House and for every speaker who followed. And I can sum up all of those rules with that one word, compromise. I, I, I was stunned a few weeks ago to read in a major daily newspaper an editorial that praised our, our current and uh, about to leave uh, the Congress, our current speaker, John Boehner, for having, and this is a quote from this newspaper, perfected the art of disagreeing without being disagreeable. That's not the job of the speaker. He's not there to be, to be disagreeable or to disagree. The art of the great speakers in American history, the art that Henry Clay perfected, is that of compromising, not disagreeing. And the great speakers who followed, modeled themselves after Clay, all perfected the art of compromising. Now, now, most Americans don't realize that the Speaker of the House of Representatives is the second most powerful elected federal official in the land after the President. And like the President, he is the only other official in the federal government elected by all Americans, by the entire nation, by we the people. Now, sometimes it seems like neither the president nor the speaker listens to any of us. But that, that's because we, the people, don't speak with a single voice. Americans are a diversified people with a country whose size and geometry and geography make universal solutions impossible. We all disagree, and each of us has unalienable rights to do so and to pursue our selfish interests with benefits to ourselves and unwelcome effects on others. But to remain united as a nation, each of us and our elected representatives in Congress must compromise and make personal and collective sacrifices. And that's what the speaker's job is. That's what he's supposed to manage, these compromises that hold the nation together. In the, in the 225 years since the first Congress convened, the members of every, every House of Representatives have elected one member to do that job, to reconcile our conflicting interests. They call him the elect of the elect, the elected leader of the elected representatives of we the people. Most, think, most people think the speaker is elected by the majority party in the House of Representatives. That's not true. He's nominated by the majority party, and he belongs to that party when he's nominated. But the entire membership of the House must elect him. In other words, all the representatives of all the people must elect the speaker. And they called him then, and uh, some people still call him the elect of the elect. As I said, the speaker's powers are second only to the president himself. He commands the legislative process. The president controls the executive process. He puts the laws into effect and enforces the law. The Speaker of the House is the man who 
controls the legislative process. He names the chairs of all the, all the committees and influences the appointment of the membership of each committee. He, through these, through these committees, he controls whether and when a bill can come to the floor for a vote. He selects which members can speak and for how long. He selects those who can speak for a bill and against a bill. In the early 1800s, uh, one uh, elderly congressman spoke well beyond his allotted time in the House. And the speaker at the time, you, you may have guessed his name, Henry Clay, uh, Clay brought his gavel down like thunder to stop the old man from talking. But I speak to posterity, the old man cackled. Yes, sir, Clay responded, but you seem resolved to continue speaking until your audience arrives, and I won't allow it. <laughs> and that's why Henry Clay is on the cover of my new book and the reason I'm here today. Too few Americans understand the role and powers of the speaker. Clay not only refined and defined that role and those powers, he became the greatest speaker in American history. Sadly, uh, our most recent speaker uh, either didn't understand the role or refused to accept it. He put parochial interests of his Ohio districts and the interests of his political party ahead of the nation's interests which would be fine if he were an ordinary congressman. But he wasn't. Once the House of Representatives elects its speaker, that person is no longer permitted to debate or even to vote in the House. He is no longer there to agree or disagree. He is there to engineer compromises that will bring a majority of Congress a majority of Americans together in the interests of our nation. Now, we are often a very difficult people to bring together, which is why in the more than 200 years since the uh, first Congress convened, the House has only enacted 5% of all proposed legislation, 5%. In other words, 95% of most laws that are proposed are, are rejected. Some say that's dysfunctional. If a new law helps you and doesn't hurt me, I may be for it. But if it hurts me, I'm against it. So Congress is not dysfunctional. Congress simply reflects the views of people like you and me the people its members represented. And, and that's what the Founding Fathers intended when they wrote the Constitution. They wanted to create a Congress that would further majority interests without damaging minority interests. And that means few new laws would ever get passed. That's not dysfunction. That's democracy. Alexand Alexander Hamilton said that if you want a government that acts quickly, efficiently, and does things absolutely perfectly, get a dictator. Otherwise, embrace the system we have. Few new laws will ever get passed, and those that do will mean huge sacrifices for some and benefits for others. The laws that get passed will be huge compromises that will seldom satisfy everyone. A lot of people will get a little. Very few people will get all they want. James Madison helped write the Constitution and explained the intent of the framers. And these are Madison's words. Not the rich more than the poor. Not the learned more than the ignorant. Not the haughty heirs of distinguished names more than the humble sons of obscurity and unpropitious fortune. The electors are to be the great body of the people of the United States. And that's what we have in the House of Representatives. And the person who is supposed to reconcile 
the conflicting views of that great body of people and their electors is the Speaker of the House. As I said, Henry Clay was the greatest statesman in American history. And Americans in his day called him the great compromiser. He was both Speaker of the House at first and then became uh, the equivalent of the Senate Majority Leader a bit later in his life. And during those two periods of his life, he saved this nation by engineering five monumental compromises between bitterly divided congressmen from the pro-slavery South and the Free Soil North. He started with the famed Missouri Compromise in 1820. And like his other compromises, that, the Missouri Compromise, prevented secession of the South and postponed the outbreak of civil war for 40 years. And by postponing civil war for that long a period of time, he allowed the nation to mature and survive the civil war that eventually came. And here's why. When Missouri applied for statehood in 1819, it, it applied as a, as a uh, slave state. And had it entered the Union at that time, it would have absolutely threatened national existence. It would have given slave states a majority for the very first time in the Congress and the power to pass laws perpetuating slavery in the United States, the entire United States, indefinitely. Well, uh, a few Northerners weren't going to have that. New York Representative uh, James Talmadge demanded a rider to Missouri's application. He wanted to ban entry of any more slaves into Missouri and emancipate all the children uh, age 25, children born to slaves already in Missouri. In other words, the Talmadge writer would have converted Missouri into a free state and given the free states a majority and the power in Congress to emancipate all the slaves in this nation forever. Well, now the Southerners rose in outrage. George's Thomas Cobb exploded with anger and shouted at Talmadge, if you persist, the Union will be dissolved. Talmadge shouted back through the uproar, if a dis dissolution of the Union must take place, let it be so. If civil war must come, I can only say let it come. Only Speaker Henry Clay remained calm in this storm. His, his wide mouth, uh, for almost from ear to ear, always made him look as if he was grinning, even when he wasn't. He was uh, totally opposed to dissolution and resolved to prevent it. But he knew that dissolution in 1820 was, would not lead to civil war, certainly not over slavery. Abolitionism was in its infancy in 1820. John Brown was only 20 years old, just got married thinking about making babies, not, not, not making war. If southern states had seceded then, few northerners would have cared. They would have said, good riddance. They would not have gone to war and certainly not risk death to free a bunch of black people in the south. Northerners uh, had almost as many slaves as southerners did. Only New England had freed slaves by 1820. New York wouldn't emancipate its slaves until 1827, and mobs there rioted against abolition. Although Pennsylvania and New Jersey had ended interstate trade, they blocked emancipation as unconstitutional confiscation of private property without due process. So Clay did not fear civil war in 1820. What he did fear was the breakup of his dream and that of President Monroe at the time. His dream was to see this potentially huge American empire stretch from sea to shining sea and become uh, the richest, grandest, freest nation in the world. Had the South seceded at that time, it would have broken up the nation into 
two parts and possibly three parts because the central states might have seceded as well. And he, these three small, vulnerable little nations would be open to conquest by any one of the, uh, the ambitious world powers at the time, Spain, France, and Britain. The American Revolution would have gone on uh, onto the trash bin of history and been forgotten. So as the debate over Missouri statehood raged, Clay sought and found an opportunity for compromise. He offered Maine a chance to separate from Massachusetts and join the Union as a free state by linking its admission with that of Missouri and no strings attached to either one. He allowed the Missouri Compromise allowed free states and slave states to retain equal votes in the Senate and continue living together in peace in the same union. Compromise. Now the importance of Clay's compromise didn't become, begin to come clear until more than a decade later when a new younger generation of northern abolitionists began to emerge. They had been raised without slaves, schooled by preachers who taught them to detest slavery as sinful and sacrilegious. As abolitionists grew in number and their voices intensified, many called for a war of emancipation. Now, Clay quieted that first generation with more compromises in 1833, 1836, and 1850. Indeed, the Compromise of 1833 originally tried to tie a few southern states to the northern states with closer trade relations. Northerners had imposed high protective tariffs on goods coming in from the south, goods that were made with slave labor and priced so low that northern goods couldn't compete. Northern goods, uh, northern manufacturers producing goods uh, by workers paid by the peace. They couldn't compete with free slave labor. So they slapped uh, a, a, what they thought was a killing ta high tariff on them, 20% on all southern goods, regardless of whether they came directly from the south or via uh, other countries like England, which took the cheap southern cotton and converted it into, into cheap textiles, with which they flooded the northern markets. Well, the tariffs were so high they began to affect exports out of the South. And Southern uh, congressmen began to uh, threaten secession again and civil war until Henry Clay stepped in to calm everyone down. Instead of forcing North and South to choose between high tariffs and no tariffs, he proposed a gradual, a gradual approach suggested reducing northern tariffs a little bit each year over a 10-year period. That would give each side partial protection for a, a long enough period of time for their, produ their production to adjust to the tariff changes and to keep trading with each other and stay in the union, which is all he wanted there. His next compromise came three years later in 1836 after Texas rebelled and declared independence from Mexico and it applied for uh, to be annexed by the United States as another state. But as with Texas, as with Missouri, Texas statehood would have given slave states a majority in Congress. It also might have provoked Mexico to declare war on the United States. So Clay had to work out another compromise, more complicated this time. Any compromise had to maintain Senate parity between slave states and free soil states to keep them all in the Union, and also avoid war with Mexico, which claimed Texas as its own and had not recognized Texas independence. So Clay's compromise immediately rejected annexation of Texas outright, which mollified Mexico, and it mollified the northern abolitionists. Texas would not be part of the, of the Union. 
Now he had to satisfy the Southerners. He did so not by recognizing Texas, but by granting Texas, just letting it be, and granting it all the privileges of statehood. Uh, it, it, he opened the borders and let uh, duty-free exchanges of goods take place, and people go back and forth just as they would across any other state line. But Texas was not a state. It wasn't a slave state, and it wasn't a free state. It was nothing. As with all other clay compromises, the Compromise of 1836 had nothing to do with slavery. It had to do with preserving the Union. By extending the peaceful existence and integrity of the Union, Clay was now able to put his, to translate his dream into action. His dream was the most grandiose economic and social scheme probably in world history, but certainly in American history. He called it the American system. Now, in contrast to Speaker John Boehner, who couldn't or wouldn't work with one president that he didn't like, Clay worked with 10 different presidents, many of them bitter political foes, and with feuding states across the nation to bring all these feuding entities, these federal and state officials together to make the U.S. the world's most prosperous nation, to fulfill his dream. Under Clay's leadership, they built a network of roads, canals, and eventually railroads that linked every corner of 20 northern, central, midwestern, and western states into a huge transportation network. Until then, everybody had to go on horseback. So no one crossed state lines. The average American, if you asked him the name of his country, he would say, Virginia, New York, Delaware. Now, suddenly, vast numbers of people and businesses could move about the Union freely and easily. They established agricultural, commercial, financial, political, and social connections that soon made the 20 states of the Union one. It made dissolution of that Union unthinkable. Thousands, tens of thousands, moved west but returned regularly to visit families they had left behind, and vice versa. Businesses and banks set up branches in different states, farmers and merchants Brought, bought and shipped goods across state lines and had important clients and sources of supply in states other than their own. They were not about to let a handful of baronial southern plantation owners destroy their businesses and livelihoods. Clay's last compromise, the Compromise of 1830, admitted California as a free state and finally Texas as a slave state. The balance remained equal. Among other things, the Compromise of 1850, though, expanded the number of free states linked by the American system to 20 states with more than 20 million people. That compared to only 5.5 million in the 11 independence-minded southern states. Unionists, whatever their states of origin, had now become Americans, and in 1860, they went to war to preserve that the union that Henry Clay spent his life creating. Clay explained the purpose of his life, and by the way, he, he ran for the, unsuccessfully for the presidency four times, but that wasn't his primary goal, to become president. He explained the goal, his life's goal, very, very simply. If anyone desires to know, and these are Henry Clay's words, if anyone desires to know the paramount object of my public life, the preservation of the Union will furnish him the key. Abraham Lincoln used Clay's words to express his own views. 
I can express all my views, and this is Lincoln talking now, I can express all my views by quoting Henry Clay. I worshiped him as a teacher and leader. He loved his country. He gave the death blow to fraternal strife and peace, brought peace to a distracted land. Again, Abraham Lincoln talking. Uh, uh, another little known fact, most Americans don't realize that Abraham Lincoln's in-laws were close friends of the Clays in Lexington, Kentucky. Lincoln's wife, Mary Todd, grew up almost next door to the Clays. As the young Lincoln wooed and then married Mary Todd, Clay became Lincoln's friend and mentor. And before he became president, Lincoln served in Congress where Clay had made compromise the guiding principle. Now, Clay died before the war began. But when he died, Lincoln gave this stirring eulogy, looking to heaven and cocking his ear. Lincoln said, I recognize Clay's voice speaking today as it ever spoke for the Union, for the Constitution, for the freedom of man. And when Lincoln sent Union forces to war, he explained why in words that might easily have been those of Henry Clay. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union, President Lincoln explained. It is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some then leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery, I do because I believe it helps to save this union. And what I don't do, what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the union. Abraham Lincoln listened to Henry Clay throughout his political life, as have all the great statesmen in American history. We must now pray, hope, that Congress will elect a speaker who will do the same and help save and preserve our union and bring us together as a people instead of dividing us. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you all and God bless America. Thank you very much. I am open uh, to questions, and I'll be signing books a little bit later on. Uh, yes, sir. It's interesting to hear you enunciate the principle that compromise is really the foundational value that underpins the Constitution, and that the founders saw this, because today, the word compromise is actually brandished as a weapon against Democrats or Republicans who seek to compromise, that they're not acting with a purity of purpose on behalf of narrow constituencies. It's, it's, what, it's, what can the country do, what can citizens well, do to those, discourage those, this those disturbing oppose, trend? Those who oppose compromise uh, do not believe in the American way, are enemies of this country, and are border, borderline on the border of treason. Because that attitude, that a small, tiny, little self, uh, uh, selfish group should dictate to the majority, uh, that's Nazism, that's communism, that's not American democracy, that's not what this republic was built on. And a strong speaker should get these people under control. He's failed to do that. That's why we need a good speaker now who will unite us as a people and dismiss uh, these extremists, and we, we've had presidents who've, who've faced this, uh, Eisenhower faced it, and, and dismissed them from his political party and from influence in his political party. Uh, Roosevelt united us as a people, Lincoln united us, uh, uh, members of the Union at least, the states of the Union. Uh, so we've had great leaders in both the executive and the legislative branch uh, that 
truly believe in the values of this country and bring us together as a people. Well, what would it take for a speaker to be able to assert that principle without being driven out? Well, remember that the, the, the speaker is elected by the entire House. He's nominated by his political party. Uh, the force of his personality uh, is, is basically, I mean, no one should run for speaker unless they know they can unite people. Uh, I mean, what was it that, that uh, General Eisenhower was able to do to bring people together? What's the force of his personality? And that's the kind of speaker. And we've had great speakers. Uh, most Americans don't know the names of our speakers because when they, when, when they get elected, they're elected by a little tiny group in a little constituency no one's ever heard of. The, uh, the president campaigns across the country and is elected by, directly by all of us. Speaker is elected by a little constituency. It's in the House that he gains uh, notoriety by organizing uh, members and uh, eventually building up a large enough constituency, showing them how they can come together. Engineering a compromise is, a, is an art. It's not something uh, anyone can do. Uh, mo most people try to engineer a compromise and all sides walk out, make, make enemies of everybody. Uh, but uh, a man like Clay uh, was able to bring them all together. And that's the kind of a man that should be running for speaker, a man whose object is to bring different sides together, not whose object is to further the interests of his community. He loses his status as a representative if he wants to be speaker. He has to be speaker of all the United States, not just for his little constituency. Yeah, hi. Um, you know, in history, you've got men and times. So you've got Henry, you've got Henry Clay. You've got a, in history, you've got men or women and the times in which he's in. So, you know, you can't divorce the two. Clay had this idea of union, but they also had this thing of slavery, which most people kind of felt maybe in some way there'd be a split. So my question is this. Obviously, we're in a period now where compromise does seem, as a, to kind of segue into the following question, where compromise is really a bad word. It's almost like some four-letter words. So is there something specific about the time, in your thinking, is there something specific about the times today that makes compromise more difficult than in Clay's time? Or is it just we don't have a Henry Clay out there yet who rose above that? That's first question. And then second question, if we believe, as you do, that compromise is important, and if we believe, as you seem to claim, and some of us agree, that the people that we've had right now in Congress are not doing that, and you want to show them somebody, you could show them Henry Clay, what other two speakers would you suggest that they study or could understand how compromise is reached if they really don't understand how? Just uh, touch on the second question because there have been many, many speakers. Right. But one of the most famous ones was Sam Rayburn right. uh, with Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, Rayburn, uh, uh, an archy Democrat uh, who campaigned for Adlai Stevenson uh, and yet worked very, very well with uh, Eisenhower. They both loved their country and worked for the interests of their country. Um, I would answer the first question, and of course, I can't. Uh, prove it, but uh, uh, I'd say, uh, no, it was more difficult then. Uh, the, 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 the Deep South, remember, was run by a handful, literally a handful of plantation owners. Uh, and the bitterness between the slave states and the free soil states was intense. Uh, it, it, and, it, and it touched every area of life, uh, not just so social life and religious life, uh, it touched, as I, ta as I mentioned before, it touched commercial life because uh, these barons in the South, uh, and we're talking about maybe two dozen people, uh, were swamping markets with s cheap goods made by slave labor. <laughs> uh, and, and that inflamed uh, the, the commercial, financial interests of the North as well as uh, the moral interests of the North. Uh, th this was an impossible uh, breach uh, in the conduct of these two parts of the country. And as I say, Clay never solved that problem, but he held the nation together by finding enough common ground to build this American system and truly unite 
the rest of the nation. Uh, civil war uh, probably was inevitable because uh, we were, were talking about a bunch of oligarchs in the South. In any given state, you could call any, any given state, you could call it a dictatorship. Uh, but certainly an oligarchy uh, in South Carolina, John Calhoun was a dictator, uh, effectively. Uh, at one point, <laughs> Clay worked with Calhoun, and Calhoun's d worst enemy, Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, and the three of them came up with uh, the Compromise of 1833, so much so that <laughs> the, the nation called these three men the Great Triumvirate. It didn't last long, but, but for a while it, 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 was, it was remarkable that Clay was able to bring these two men together. And you know, Clay's influence on Kentuckians was rather remarkable because initially, when the Civil War did break out, remember, Kentucky, slavery was, was legal. And uh, Clay himself had slaves. Uh, that was Kentucky law. Kentucky law banned emancipation of slaves. So you couldn't free your slaves if you wanted to. You'd, you'd, you'd be fined and possibly in prison. Uh, Kentucky remained neutral. And Tennessee, <laughs> the jerks who ran Tennessee, decided to invade Kentucky. That was a mistake. <laughs> Kentucky would have was not going to have anybody invading their state. And they, they now joined the Union and fought with the North in the Civil War. Uh, if Ohio had done it, they would have joined the South. But they were neutral. They wanted to stay neutral. Thank does you. that answer all your yes, questions? Yes, it does. I hope so. Thank you. And thank you for your questions, by the way. <coughs> yes, sir. Has the House at any time consider electing a speaker from a non-member of the House? No, no, the rules don't permit that. I understood it, the it rules do permit. has to be the elect of the elect. You say the Constitution doesn't forbid it, does it? Uh, sometimes uh, the, 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 the fight for the speakership goes on ballot after ballot after ballot, but that's happened with the presidency also. Uh, the election of yeah. Thomas Jefferson went on for uh, 33, 34, 35 ballots. But as I understand it, tell me if it's not correct, the Speaker does not have to be a member of the House. No, he has to be a member of the House, yes. Thank you. I'd like to say that I was under that misunderstanding too because during some of the news coverage when Mr. Boehner announced his resignation, some were reporting that you could. So thank you for setting the record straight on that. No, uh, the, the, the names I've seen, they're all members of the House. OK. Um, my question is, is it only the party with the majority that can nominate the speaker? I'm sorry? Is it only the party that is in the majority that can nominate well, the speaker? Well, they have the most votes. Usually. So it's just logical. And, and if they can come together, uh, they usually uh, nominate, they make the first nomination uh, who, has, who then has the most votes. And it's like a convention, like a Democratic National Convention or the Republican mm -hmm. National Convention. The one with the most votes uh, gets voted on by the entire convention first. Sometimes he wins, sometimes he's, he's voted down. Uh, we saw uh, Mrs. Clinton get voted down uh, when uh, uh, President Obama, uh, Mr. Obama then, right. uh, had, had more convention delegates. Well, does... And it's the same. It's, okay. it's basically a convention with a built-in split between two and sometimes three or four uh, parties. parties. Right. So you really have to win the nomination within your party. If, if you're in the majority party, you need to get enough votes from them. Exactly. That's what uh, uh, Representative McCarthy thought he had last week and uh, now is running into opposition within his own party. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. it's, uh, it's going to be a tough fight uh, because uh, I, it, it, if any of the candidates are truly patriotic speakers, they are not going to, to uh, become slaves to little minorities within their party. So they have to find a way to calm everybody down. 
and, and, and really teach them that this is in the interest of your country. You're here, yes, to serve your constituents, to represent their views, but you're here to serve the country. Yes, sir, do you have a question? Yes, I, I was aware because I read the Constitution that he had to be a member of the House, but your comment earlier is the first I've heard that the Speaker loses his right to cast a vote as a representative of his district. When and how did that come about? I, I'm, I'm awfully sorry. I just didn't... I got some of the words much, I much earlier, you had said that once the, the Speaker is elected, he no longer is allowed to cast a vote in the House, right. which would mean that he's deprived of his right to vote as a representative of his district, and I've never seen anything to that effect before. When and how did this come about? Well, it's, these are standard rules of order. Uh, the, it, it's like the vice president who was president of the Senate. He cannot vote in the Senate. He has no vote. And uh, now in his case, he's not even an elected senator. Exactly. Uh, but, but in the case of the speaker and in the case of all uh, presidents, uh, these, are, these are rules of order that predate uh, our nation at the Constitutional Convention. Uh, George Washington was elected president of the convention. With that, he lost his vote, although he was a delegate from Virginia. He was elected by Virginians to, uh, come to attend the convention. He could no longer vote, and he could no longer take sides. Uh, that is the role of the president of any convention. He presides. He does not participate. Then Thank is, you. Is there this, this is a rule that supersedes the Constitution? I'm sorry? Is this rule of order something that supersedes the Constitution, which does not forbid him to vote? Well, it has, it, 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 the, the Constitution gives each of these branches of government certain uh, leeway in determining their rules of how they are going to fulfill their obligations to the American people and to the nation. And one uh, way to do it is to keep order, uh, not to pull out a Derringer and shoot each other. Uh, you, you've got to get along some, somewhere, and you need someone to maintain order. Uh, uh, because remember, as I said, when Henry Clay went into the House of Representatives for the first time, it was, it was bedlam. And Clay himself uh, participated uh, in uh, several duels and was nearly killed uh, because he, it was the only way of maintaining order at that time until he was able to uh, establish rules of conduct. Yes, ma'am. Could you explain why the, the Senate doesn't have more, uh, why the Speaker of the House has more power than any uh, leader or the majority leader on the Senate side? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, the, the Senate uh, was originally a body to represent the states. The states, until uh, 1917, I think, uh, uh, certainly uh, in, in, in the first uh, two decades of, of the 20th century, the, se the two senators were appointed by the state legislature. They were not elected by the people. They were not part of the people. They represented state interests. So their whole purpose was different. And uh, the compromise in the Constitution, because state legislatures, of course, for the most part, were controlled by uh, the, 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 the big financial interests of each state. Uh, this was to give the people uh, representation that's why they gave the House of Representatives uh, uh, equal powers, even greater powers in certain areas uh, than the Senate. Uh, the Senate was con considered the equivalent of the House of Lords, a patrician, uh, a body of patricians. And they were given uh, powers over foreign treaties and, other, and foreign affairs that the House lacks. But the House was given power to uh, spending our money. Uh, because they are our representatives, so uh, they, they have their hands in our pockets. Uh, if, uh, sorry to say that. Uh, uh, but uh, that, the, the, the purpose of the Senate was different from the purpose of the House, and that was one of the great compromises 
uh, they made at the Constitutional Convention, creating these two, uh, a bicameral uh, legislature, one representing the people, because the Constitution begins, we the people of the United States, and uh, the other representing uh, slightly more uh, esoteric uh, interests, foreign affairs, things that uh, the ordinary people would not understand or have any uh, knowledge about. Uh, but even in the Senate, uh, the, the Constitutional Convention had to compromise because there was a, a major, major fight uh, over how many senators each state would have. Uh, originally, uh, the, the, the Constitutional Convention, uh, uh, the, the, the three largest states in the Union at that time were Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. And the, uh, the, the Continental Congress that had preceded the, the Constitution gave each state one vote so that all states were equal. Uh, now the big states said, uh-uh, no more of that. We have far more people than you, you guys do, and we want proportional representation. Well, they got that in the House. But the Senate uh, said, no, if we give the big states uh, more votes, uh, give them proportional representation in the Senate, three states will be able to dominate all the other states in the Union at that time, all the nine other states. And uh, uh, those nine states uh, basically rebelled and threatened to leave the convention uh, unless they had equal representation. They did not want to be dominated by these three states. Uh, the big states argued, well, nine states with fewer people than us are going to tell the majority of the people what to do. So this went down to uh, the wire until uh, Washington stepped in. And uh, <laughs> basically, uh, he had a way of intimidating people uh, the way Ike did, too. I guess all commanding generals have that, that part of their personality. But uh, uh, because he, as I say, he couldn't vote or express his views in the in the convention, but he could do so at the city tavern <laughs> uh, after the convention adjourned each day. And he made his views perfectly clear. Uh, you have to settle this, uh, or I will settle it for you. So they compromised. Washington, uh, they said Washington, uh, Lincoln, Roosevelt, uh, uh, Eisenhower, probably uh, the four greatest compromisers uh, in, in the presidency. You may, you, you may think of others, and you'll probably be right. Uh, but uh, uh, Washington brought those, that, that convention to heel and forced them to compromise. I want to thank you very much for coming today, ladies and gentlemen. It's been an honor to be here and talk to you. Thank you. Book signing one level up in the book.